All right, chapter number two of the day. New do 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 do, and of the island twenty four. So the plan this week is edit, read, edit, read, edit, read, edit, read until I get everything done, and hopefully I get that done quick. The faster I edit and read, the faster I get to read what I want to read. I'm trying to get to where I'm like two months out in audiobook books um, for my audiobook recording paid stuff. Um, I'm also trying to read through the next book that I'm doing on this podcast, although the next one's a little bit odd. Chapter 24. Enter Jonas. Prospect Point, August 20th. Oh, wrong one. 24... Oh, Phil is the bubbly one. Let me just look it up. Phil. For the time I would. Yes. Hold on. Undo that. 20th. Dear Anne, spelled with an E, wrote Phil. I must prop my eyelids open long enough to write you. I've neglected you shamefully this summer, honey, but all my other correspondents have been neglected too. Did too. I have a huge pile of letters to answer, so I must gird up the loins of my mind and hoe in. Excuse my mixed metaphors. I'm fearfully sleepy. Last night, Cousin Emily and I were calling at a neighbor's. There were several other callers there, and as soon as those unfortunate creatures left, our hostess and her three daughters picked them all to pieces. I knew they would begin on Cousin Emily and me as soon as the door shut behind us. When we came home, Mrs. Lilly informed us that the aforesaid neighbor's hired boy was supposed to be down with scarlet fever. You can always trust Mrs. Lilly to tell you cheerful things like that. I have a horror of scarlet fever. I couldn't sleep when I went to bed for thinking of it. I tossed and tumbled about, dreaming fearful dreams when I did snooze for a minute. And at three, I wakened up with a high fever, a sore throat, and a raging headache. I knew I had scarlet fever. I got up in a panic and hunted up Cousin Emily's doctor book to read up the symptoms. And I had them all. So I went back to bed and knowing the worst, slept like a top the rest of the night. Though why a top should sleep sounder than anything else, I never could understand. But this morning I was quite well, so it couldn't have been the fever. I suppose if I did catch it last night, it couldn't have developed so soon. I can remember that in daytime, but at three o'clock at night, I never can be logical. I suppose you wonder what I'm doing at Prospect Point. Well, I always like to spend a month of summer at the shore, and father insists that I come to his second cousin Emily's select boarding house at Prospect Point. So a fortnight ago, I came as usual, and as usual, old Uncle Mark Miller brought me from the station with his ancient buggy and what he calls his generous purpose horse. He's a nice old man and gave me a handful of pink peppermints. Peppermints always seem to me such a religious sort of candy. I suppose because when I was a little girl, Grandmother Gordon always gave them to me in church. Once I asked, referring to the smell of peppermints, is that the odor of sanctity? I didn't like to eat Uncle Mark's peppermints because he just fished them loose out of his pocket and had to pick some rusty nails and other things from among them before he gave them to me. But I wouldn't hurt his dear old feelings for anything, so I carefully sewed them along the road at intervals. When the last one was gone, Uncle Mark said a little rebukingly, You shouldn't have ate all um candies to onct, Miss Phil. You likely will have the stomach ache. Cousin Emily has only five boarders besides myself, four old ladies and one young man. Young man. My right-hand neighbor is Mrs. Lily. She's one of those people who seem to take a gruesome pleasure in detailing all their many aches and pains and sicknesses. You cannot mention any ailment, but she says, shaking her head, ah, I know too well what that is. And then you get all the details. Jonas declares he once spoke of locomotor attack. The details. Jonas declares he once spoke of locomotor ataxia in hearing, and she said she knew too well what that was. She suffered from it for 10 years and was finally cured by a traveling doctor. Who is Jonas? Just wait, Anne Shirley. You'll heal. Heal. Anne Shirley. You'll hear all about Jonas in proper time and place. He's not to be mixed up with esteemable old ladies. 
My left-hand neighbor at the table is Mrs. Finney. She always speaks with a wailing, dolorous voice. You're nervously expecting her to burst into tears every moment. She gives you the impression that life to her is indeed a veil of tears, and that a smile, never to speak of a laugh, is a frivolity truly reprehensible. She has a worse opinion of me than Aunt Jamesina, and she doesn't love me hard to atone for it, as Auntie Jay does either. Miss Maria Grimsby sits catty corner from me. The first day I came, I remarked to Miss Maria that it looked a little like rain, and Miss Maria laughed. I said the road from the station was very pretty, and Miss Maria laughed. I said there seemed to be a few mosquitoes left yet, and Miss Maria laughed. I said that Prospect Point was as beautiful as ever, and Miss Maria laughed. If I were to say to Miss Maria, my father has hanged himself, my mother has taken poison, my brother is in the penitentiary, and I am in the last stages of... and I am in the last stages of consumption, Miss Maria would laugh. She can't help it. She was born so, but it is very sad and awful. My brother is in the penitentiary, and I am in the last stage of Jerry, and I am in the last... Okay. ...and awful. The fifth old lady is Mrs. Grant. She's a sweet old thing, but she never says anything but good of anybody, and so she is a very uninteresting conversationalist. And now for Jonas, Anne. That first day I came, I saw a young man sitting opposite me at the table, smiling at me as if he had known me from my cradle. I knew, for Uncle Mark had told me that his name was Jonas Blake, that he was a theological student from St. Columbia, and that he had taken charge of the Point Prospect Mission Church for the summer. He's a very ugly young man, really the ugliest young man I've ever seen. He has a big, loose-jointed figure with absurdly long legs. His hair is toe color and lank. His eyes are green, and his mouth is big, and his ears. But I never think about his ears if I can help it. He has a lovely voice. If you shut your eyes, he is adorable. And he certainly has a beautiful soul and disposition. We were good chums right away. Of course, he's a graduate of Redmond, and that is the link between us. We fished and boated together, and we walked on the sands by moonlight. He didn't look so homely by moonlight, and oh, he was nice. Niceness fairly exhaled from him. The old ladies, except Mrs. Grant, don't approve of Jonas because he laughs and jokes, and because he evidently likes the society of frivolous me better than theirs. Somehow, Anne, I don't want him to think me frivolous. This is ridiculous. Why should I care what a toad her toad toe? ridiculous. Why should I care what a tow-haired person called Jonas, whom I never saw before, thinks of me? Last Sunday, Jonas preached in the village church. I went, of course, but I couldn't realize that Jonas was going to preach. The fact that he was a minister, or going to be one, persisted in seeming a huge joke to me. Well, Jonas preached, and by the time he had preached ten minutes, I felt so small and insignificant that I thought I must be invisible to the naked eye. Jonas never said a word about women, and he never looked at me. But I realized then and there what a pitiful, frivolous, small-souled little butterfly I was, and how horribly different I must be from Jonas's ideal woman. She would be grand and strong and noble. He was so earnest and tender and true. He was everything a minister ought to be. I wonder how I could ever thought him ugly, but he really is, with those inspired eyes and that intellectual brow which the roughly falling hair hid on weekdays. It was a splendid sermon, and I could have listened to it forever, and it made me feel utterly wretched. Oh, I wish I was like you, Anne. He caught up with me on the road home and grinned as cheerfully as usual, but his grin could never deceive me again. I had seen the real Jonas. I wondered if he could ever see the real Phil, whom nobody, not even you, Anne, has ever seen yet. Jonas, I said. I forgot to call him Mr. Blake. Wasn't it dreadful? But there are times when things that... Eh. Isn't it dreadful? But there are times... Where am I? Isn't it dreadful? But there are times when things like that don't matter. Jonas, you were born to be a minister. You couldn't be anything else. There's a mosquito in here. My house is full of them right now and it's driving me crazy. 
yesterday while we were packing the garage we had to have basically the garage door to the house open all day and now all the stupid things flew in anything else no i couldn't he said soberly i tried to be something else for a long time i didn't want to be a minister but i came to see at last that it was the work given me to do and god helping me i shall try to do it his voice was low and reverent. I thought that he would do his work and do it well and nobly, and happy the woman fitted by nature and training to help him do it. She would be no feather blown about by every fickle wind of fancy. She would always know what hat to put on. Probably she would have only one. Ministers never have much money, but she wouldn't mind having one hat or none at all because she would have Jonas. And surely don't you dare to say or hint or think that I've fallen in love with Mr. Blake. Could I care for a lank, poor, ugly theologue named Jonas? As Uncle Mark says, it's impossible. And what's more, it's improbable. Good night, Phil. P.S. It is impossible, but I'm horribly afraid it's true. I'm happy and wretched and scared. He can never care for me, I know. Do you think I could ever develop into a passable minister's wife, Anne? And would they expect me to lead in prayer? P. G. I'm just ready. Like, hopefully you all know that, like, she ends up with Gilbert. But, like, how long does that take? Like, we're most of the way through the third, or at least halfway through the third book. Maybe if people would stop saying she's going to end up with him, she wouldn't. All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs>